This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. Fire, ready, aim. That's how life feels like sometimes, doesn't it? Perhaps even a wee bit too often. What if we could find that pause, that deep breath? What would we reflect on in that moment? How might we choose different, maybe a different course, a different way forward, a different response? And if we did, what peace and joy and fulfillment might that moment open up for us? Well, today, that is the focus of our conversation. We have Jamie Price, the co-founder and president of Stop, Breathe, and Think, an emotional wellness app that recommends short, personalized meditations tuned to your emotions. Jamie left the ranks of the Fortune 500 America with the intention of creating positive change in our world. She's also one of the founders of Tools for Peace and has spent the last 16 years developing curriculum and teaching mindfulness and meditation to at-risk youth. Jamie has studied and practiced meditation under the guidance of a traditionally trained Buddhist teacher since 2000. As the co-founder of Stop, Breathe, and Think, she is regularly quoted in publications such as Livestrong.com, Brit Plus Co., Bustle, and many, many more. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Absolutely. Jamie, if I must say, it sounds like you're you're kind of crushing it out there. Uh, your meditation app, it's been touted by Fast Company, Outside Magazine, Cool Mom Tech. Uh, you've received re- rewards, uh, awards for this. You've had great mention from Stanford University Center for Compassion and Altruism Research. Just really an impressive track record of what you're accomplishing and what the app is is doing and obviously the need that uh, it is filling out there in the marketplace. Uh, but before we go there, I wanted to take you back a little bit to the corporate America time because I wanted to give uh, everybody a sense of, of what your journey's been and where it began. So I'm curious if you could share before the app, uh, before you started the nonprofit Tools for Peace, what exactly were you doing in corporate America? What were those days like? Oh my gosh. I actually went to law school and got a law degree. And while I was taking the bar in New York City, I was offered a job at Smith Barney as an investment banker. Hmm. And I took it. It was a great opportunity. I was excited for that kind of challenge since I had no experience in that area. Hmm. And did that for about two years. Um, Really enjoyed what I was learning, but realized while I was in that job, that it really wasn't fulfilling on a deeper level, Mm -hmm. that I was really missing a sense of meaning and purpose. But I just wasn't really clear what an alternative would be because my entire life, I mean, I had come from a really conservative family. My father's a successful businessman. And I was really raised to believe that the most important thing in life is to have a good living, make a mm-hmm. good living, be a professional. Mm-hmm. And that that really was the priority. So it, it took a, a little time for me to figure out a different direction. I, I think that's true for for even a lot of our listeners as part of the reason they, they tune in is I think they're it's some level of or wherever they are on the journey, they've they've heard that stirring, kind of that inner voice of maybe there's more, maybe there's something different, um, something more meaningful for me to pursue. And I'm just curious, what what was it that helped you begin to figure that out so that you you could have the kind of the courage to step out and do something very different? Well, you know, it's interesting. It was kind of a two-step process. The first thing is I had a, a weekend ritual of going to Spring Street Books, mm-hmm. and I would go to the employee recommendation table and just pick up a book that really called out to me. And one day I went in there and saw this book called The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Mm. And I picked that up and read it and it just blew my mind. Mm. It was just sounded like the truth to me. And like I said, I I was raised in a conservative family, very Christian. So I had not been exposed at all to many Buddhist ideas or, or this different way of thinking. And I think that really cracked open a door in my mind. Mm hmm. Uh, that made me very receptive to eventually meeting a man who would become my teacher. Mm. Um, His his name was Lama Gyatso. So I think it was those two Mm. things that really put everything into focus for me. What what was then maybe one of, you know, one or two of the the insights that you you got out of the book, the, the Tibetan book for living and dying, that really stood out, that really kind of opened that lens for you? I think it was the fundamental 
fundamentally different framework and foundation for viewing what is a valuable, purposeful life. Mm. And that, and that was rather than, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a commercialized <laughs> approach to, you know, you earn money and then you're in a better position in life. Mm. And so everything's good. The, the radically different framework was really about kindness and compassion and that, mm that really being the priority. And I think that that just shook me to my core. Absolutely. And so then you you have this idea for this extraordinary nonprofit tools for peace. And I'm I'm curious, you know, was that something that popped into your head and you were able to just jump into it? Or what was what was the process? What <laughs> no. was the real process for getting that getting that going and finally stepping out? Well, so like I said, I met my teacher and I started learning how to meditate. I think meditation was a huge part in my ability to step out of my existing framework because it really helped me get in touch with my personal, like getting, it helped me gain clarity about my own sense of purpose and what I really wanted to do. And so I think it took a little time for me to get to that place. But then at the same time, during that time, the idea for the nonprofit pro actually arose because there was a lot of gang violence in the areas where yeah. I lived and where my teacher lived. And he really felt like if we could actually teach the skills of mindfulness and meditation to these kids, it could completely turn their lives around. Mm -hmm. But because he's a traditional, you know, Tibetan teacher. Mm -hmm. He he grew up in a monastery in Tibet since the age of four. Mm -hmm. He felt like he was not in a position to communicate in a way they would relate to. So he asked me to uh, join him. And I immediately said, yes, it seemed like an incredibly exciting challenge. Wow. So so take us then into a little bit of, of that mission of Tools for Peace and the, the work that the nonprofit is specifically doing. Sure. So we've been teaching in school and after school programs, as well as an annual teen camp since 2000. Uh, it actually took us a few years because at the time, mindfulness and meditation was still very new to most people. Mm -hmm. People were pretty unfamiliar with it. So it took a lot of work to understand how to teach and communicate it in a way that was very accessible and simple for people to step into and try. Mm -hmm. And it, so it took a couple years to develop that expertise and then we were able to formalize a curriculum um, around 2005 or so. And that's what we started teaching in schools and after school and at our teen camp. Mm -hmm. And we just saw such a great, such great results with the kids we worked with. It was very encouraging. And that ultimately led to the inspiration of releasing our app. Excellent. So I know that is part of is part of that work that was developed. We've mentioned uh, certainly the mindfulness and meditation, and I know part of that approach uh, in in just kind of researching and reading up on tools for peace is a focus that you have around social and emotional development. And I was wondering if you'd speak a little bit further to that and why that's so fundamental to to uh, the work absolutely. that you're, you're you're doing. Sure. It, it's absolutely fundamental. It's interesting because we spend a lot of time teaching our kids how to uh, achieve academically, but not much time how to uh, relate to each other, you know, with kindness and acceptance and support, for example. So that really is a fundamental thread of our curriculum, how to relate to each other, understand your own emotions, what's going on inside of you recognize that same thing in other people and find common ground to relate and support each other. And I think our curriculum does a good job of supporting that process. Yeah, well, and I, I know that you've, you've boiled it down to, you know, to, as, as you mentioned, to give everybody again the framework that these are uh, predominantly students with very, very high risk. There's there's violent backgrounds that are there. There's also incredible yeah. cultural and generational pressures, sometimes being the, the first to, to go to college, let alone potentially graduate from college as well. So significant right. stress that these, these children are under from all different directions. And you were able to boil it down to a three-step process that kind of underpins a lot of the work that you do. And I was curious if you could share a bit about that, that those three steps. The stop, breathe, and think. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the key things to do is when we're all stirred up with stress or any other emotion, usually when we act or say or do something, it's not coming from the clearest place. So the first thing you need to be able to learn to do is pause. And in that pause, you can get some space, you can breathe. And that's and breathing is a huge component to sort of calming yourself down. Um, 
calming your nervous system and really alleviating some of the symptoms of stress. And from that calmer, more spacious place, I think it's a lot easier then to think and get more clarity about what it is you really want to accomplish for yourself and the direction you actually want to take. Mm -hmm. You can start to recognize a little more the consequences of some of the actions you've taken and get a little bit more in the driver's seat of your own life and direction. And I think that that dynamic of the fact that you actually can be in the driver's seat, that you're not just like a like the tail wagging the dog, is a really positive and fundamental shift that when we saw our students get that they could do that it was really powerful. So let, let's go through that because I, I know that with stop, breathe and think, it sounds uh, it sounds kind of like that common sense. But unfortunately, all too often, common sense is a little uncommon for for some of us. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious because, you know, when that that principle first of the pause of the stop, I think is is like you said, just such a, a, a key point. How do we do that? Meaning how, how do we practice? How do we build that ability to stop? Because usually it's getting caught up in the moment and we're caught up in the emotional yeah. reaction and everything else. How do we first build that muscle of stop? It, you have to practice and you have to practice in the moments that are not high pressure or in, in the middle of something. So you build up your muscle by doing it in, in other times that are a little more relaxed. You have a little more time to, uh, you know, learn how to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually, I guess that's, that's probably a great way of being able to frame it is just like the, the athletes that train off the field for what happens on the field, similar of developing, developing that practice of what are the things that you're going to notice that are going to remind you to stop? What is that going to look like? What are you going to do in the moment to get that pause? And it's the, you know, it's the off the field training so that when the moment does arise where you do need to, to implement the pause, uh, you've got the ability to do so. Uh, I'm also, exactly. I'm also been curious, what, what are some of the, when you say breathe, um, are there specific breathing techniques or, or one that you might be able to share with us that, that helps people understand this isn't just generally stop, breathe, but there's, there's a little bit more to it to really create the full physiological effect that, uh, that I think you're, you're bringing about with your work. Yeah, the breath is a, is a pretty incredible thing, and there's a number of different te uh, techniques that we use. One is the most basic, mindful breathing, and that is where you just focus your attention on the sensation of your breath as it goes in and out. And when a thought arises or some kind of distraction like an outer sound, you just note that as thinking or sound and gently bring your attention back to the sensation of your breath. And I think that technique is simple but incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so if we practice that that pause so that we build up different ways of being able to do that in the moment, we mm -hmm. practice our breath so that we lo literally know how to physiologically slow ourselves down. When you get to the thinking part, what are some of the cues or what are some of the exercises that you use there uh, so that our, our thoughts don't start running away with us again? So based on what's going on with you mentally and emotionally, we have specific guided meditations that address that issue and can help your way through it. So for example, we have meditations on gratitude or kindness. And what those really help you do is shift your perspective and really broaden that. And sometimes just by doing that, you can really help yourself settle down and find a little more clarity. Mm, and that idea of broadening the, the perspective is probably an incredibly important one because I know some of the other things that, that I've, I've seen in, in the work that you do is around how do we cultivate that, that self-awareness? Uh, how do we understand the impact that we have on others um, and the way that we're seen and, and broadening then that sense of concern? And a lot exactly. of, right? And, that, and so much of that, we can't, uh, we can't get to that if we're trapped within the one view of life, the one perspective that we're wearing at this moment. And so I'm, I'm curious when, uh, especially with the kids that you're working with, when they apply this, when they, they practice the uh, stop, breathe and think, and they use the app, what are some of the things that start to change for them over the course of, of the coming months as they develop this practice? You know, it's really quite beautiful. There's a couple things. One is more self-confidence, their belief in themselves, in their capacity to change their own minds or affect positive change in their own life. That to me is one of the most exciting things I see. The other is a, a fundamental shift in how they relate to each other. The relationships become much more supportive, uh, trusting, 
and collaborative. And I think that's pretty exciting too. Hmm. What do you think it is that's bringing that out? What, you know, what, what, what are they connecting to that is opening them up in, in such an extraordinary way? Well, one of the things that I think really lends um, to that result is the, the check-in part and the sharing and the recognition that everyone's in the same boat experiencing very similar things. And so there's a lot of common ground. And when you recognize that, then it's a little easier to have this sense of feeling supportive or wanting to support other people who are going through something similar to you. Mm. Very much so. So if, if people want to get, uh, get started uh, and they, they want to start to develop this practice, uh, the app is, is pretty much available everywhere, correct? That's right. It's available everywhere um, on iOS and Android. What are, and what are some of the other things that, that are encompassed? Because, I mean, you've got meditations that are in there, visualizations that are there, different, uh, I believe you describe them as emotional wellness experiences that are connected. Yeah. To what, give us a little bit more of a picture of everything that's involved then with the app. Well, we started with just mindfulness and meditation, but in working with people over the last 17 years, I've really come to recognize that different people have different paths to peace of mind and they resonate differently with different tools. So what we've been doing over the last year or so is adding additional activities beyond meditation and mindfulness. So now you'll see we have emotions-based yoga and acupressure. We're going to be incorporating uh, journaling and light cognitive behavioral therapy and more things that people can really avail themselves of every day to help support their emotional wellness. Excellent. And then in, in terms of, you know, not just using the app, but also just that practice, I'm curious, what are some of your own personal practices, the rituals that help you stay in this space of both the, the, the high energy and high performance, as well as the kind of the calmness and yeah. mindfulness that you bring to what you do? Right. So I have a morning practice that is really important to me. And then I do first thing, I find that if I don't do it, get up, and sit on my cushion first thing, then it doesn't really happen. And so I do about an hour and a half of meditation practice. And I think that sets me up for just a much more clear and positive day. Mm -hmm. And then another thing is I'm actually pregnant now huh. and I have this awareness of my child all day long. And so this kind of it calls me to sort of presence and mindfulness all the time to make sure what I'm thinking and doing is in alignment with what I want my daughter to experience and to think about. Mm, that's a wonderful connection. Uh, and, and, you know, so much of not just what, what you would experience then while you're pregnant. And, and I love the way that that can extrapolate into all of us thinking about how connected we are to those around us and therefore what is that impact and that influence that we have in a very dramatic way in your instance and honestly, <laughs> I think a dramatic way for, for all of us as, as to how connected we are. Uh, and I also, I just, again, for everybody, I, I, I didn't want to glance over uh, what you were also describing with the app in terms of the breadth of what it is getting into and covering now, because for everybody, as you begin to consider developing a practice like this or deepening your own practice, a uh, key point, Jamie, that you brought out was finding what works for you and what exactly. that connects, right? And because that's what's going to help deepen it and deepen the the flow and the rhythm and connection that you have with this practice. And, and it'll be that much more meaningful uh, for, for you. I guess maybe just b before we wrap up, I guess one of the other things I'm just curious about is that even though your your teacher asked you to come work with this specific community and you you did say yes to that, there had to be, I'm guessing, just a little bit more. There was something that was in you that said, yeah, this is why I absolutely have to say yes to working with this mm. community of at risk. And I'm just curious about that side of, of what you were seeing or what you feel you were connected to that made this such an easy, yes, I've got to go, I've got to go for this. Yeah. The easy yes came from two directions. One was the teacher himself mm -hmm. and his qualities. He was, he, he just was really special. He was incredibly generous, tirelessly slow. So he, he was such a great example and utterly content. Like he had such a sense of happiness and, um, contentment that I was really missing. And I thought, you know, that is really worthwhile to learn more about and figure out how to get, you know, develop that for myself. But the other was, I've always had a, an affinity for kids. 
And to see that, you know, to see this community of people who had such potential, but very little resources at their disposal, I, I just thought it was a no no brainer. I just thought for sure, this is exactly where I want to be, where I can be a service. So I guess maybe that, that leads us full circle, uh, to, to wrap up today. The, you know, the name of the show is the, the meaningful way. And I love to be able to hear from all of our guests and our experts as to what makes life meaningful for you. Most definitely what makes life meaningful for me is when I can create and communicate tools and meditations and things that I see have a direct impact on people's lives that help them really transform their circumstances and their suffering and their ways of thinking in fundamental ways. And I think the most exciting thing is when I hear from people who use our app and listen to our meditations, for example, and say that that it's significantly transformed their lives and their daily experience. And that that is where I get my meaning. <laughs> absolutely. It is It is absolutely wonderful work. And Jamie, I want to thank you for coming on The Meaningful Way. I want to thank you for the work you're doing in the world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Everybody, obviously, I would encourage you to check out Stop, Breathe, and Think uh, in uh, in your app store, whichever ever device you happen to use. And most importantly is to reflect on what this is going to bring you to. That ability for us to create that pause within our day, within our moments, so that we can reconnect and re-anchor, re-center to ourselves, to be able to breathe into that, and then to be able to walk through what line of thinking, what are the thoughts, what are the beliefs that are going to lead me to where I want to be and what it is that I want to experience in this life. And so with that, I hope that you do check out that path, check out that app. And until next time, as always, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Meaningful Way. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and please subscribe and follow along with all these great guests, their stories and interviews. Also, it helps us a lot if you not only share some of your favorite episodes online, but also provide us feedback. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be and rate the show. Provide us some feedback and let us know how it is that we're doing. If you want to learn more about what we're up to, whether it be with the IPEC Coach Training School, the Live, Lead, Play Network, or even just what's evolving with The Meaningful Way, go on and head on over to LukeIorio.com. Mm-hmm.